we're in this series called The God Man, and uh, we're talking about Jesus. It is the uh, Christmas season, and we're speaking of the God Man Jesus. Pastor Mike and I actually were in Uruguay. Did you guys see that online? We were in Uruguay last week. And uh, how many of you guys have been to Uruguay? Any Uruguayans? Is that how you say that? Do you say that? Did I say that right? Uruguayans? <laughs> Thank you. Everyone's like, wave at me. Wave at me. Anybody? Yeah? So, no one. All right. So, uh. It was a, an a exploratory trip. Pastor Mike had been praying for probably like 20 years about the country, and so we took a trip down there. But we had a few connections with some different missionaries, some pastors, and so we went down last Tuesday. We were there for about six days. And because it was an exploratory trip, um, there wasn't, you know, there was some agenda with some missionaries, the, um, one of the superintendents of all of Uruguay, a bunch of pastors, and we're going to meet with a, some different missionaries. Um, because it's kind of exploratory, our posture for the trip was, um, was almost like that. You know, it was like an adventure of sorts. And you ever been on like an, like an adventure where it's kind of uncertain the territory you're going into? And you're, it's, it's almost like your, your senses get a little heightened, your discernment level gets a little bit higher. Um, there was one spot where we were at, which is the mouth of a river that pour, goes all the way through South America and it goes to the ocean. Pastor Mike, what was the name of that river? It was La, <laughs> that means the in Spanish. <laughs> La Bamba. And um, so, um, but we were in the water and I remember walking out and I could, there's, you know, these uh, sailboats going out and uh, I um, just watching the wind catch them and blow them. I was like, man, God, you're up to so much and you can move and move our ship and our lives in so many ways that is out of our control. Um, but you're up to something in Uruguay and you brought us here to discern hopefully what we're supposed to do, what Greenhouse is supposed to partner with what you're doing in Uruguay. Um, I, I actually teach, I just finished up, any Greenhouse School of Ministry students in the house, in this service, wave at me, woo, woo. Good, a few of you guys. Um, and uh, we just finished a class, um, 16 weeks in the uh, God Seeking the Spiritual Disciplines. It was one of the highlights of my whole fall semester and uh, teaching, discussing the spiritual disciplines with these students. And we got to the last class and we talked about um, how the spiritual disciplines are not like um, uh, legalism. In other words, you're not earning God's favor. All you're doing is putting up your cells. And then when God moves, you've got your cells up and your ears are attentive to God, what God's doing. He's up to something. He's moving. And God seeking prayer, uh, fasting, scripture memory, journaling, meditating, um, uh, all of these different spiritual disciplines are putting your cells up. And when God moves, you're like, I'm ready. And so we we're in Uruguay and our cells were up. I mean, you ever been in those moments where you're like, okay, what's, what's God up to today? What's, what's, he, what's he doing? And um, I remember there was one point in our first day, they were describing a day probably 200 years ago in Uruguay where there was a pretty um, catastrophic, uh, catastrophic event and it happened to be on my, on my birthday, April the 11th. They're like, yeah, it was eight, April 11th, 1931. I was like, there's a sign from God. All right, what's God saying? I'd meet someone with the name Robert or Roberto and I'd say, oh my gosh, there's some, like your, your scope open everything out, trying to figure out what God is up to, because God is with us, like God is with us, and I got I to be honest with you, there was a conviction in me, I was like, man, Lord, I wake up some days here, and, and I would say our life is a mission trip, it's not like we go on a mission trip, our life is a mission trip, your workplace is a mission field, your education, your school is a mission field, and we're in this place where we're trying to discover all the time, God is with us, what is God up to, right? And so we're trying to discern, we're trying to listen, we're trying to engage, and we're having these conversations, and um, I remember being at lunch with 16 pastors, and Pastor Mike is pretty good at Spanish, and I speak no Spanish, so I'm absolutely useless at this lunch. I mean, I'm trying to engage and a lot of the pastors are in their 60s and they're trying to talk to me. It's, did you film some of it sometimes? It was so bad. He's like, I got to film Robbie trying to communicate. It was, it was painful. And, uh, and we get to the end of the trip and we're at the airport and the missionaries we were with are kind of seeing us off and we're, we're putting, taking our stuff off and we're going to go through the checkpoint with um where they scan all your stuff and there's a guy behind me and he spoke english i was like oh you're from the states he said yeah i'm flying back I, i'm a a um it guy here software engineer and i'm working here in uruguay i said great he's like what are you here for 
And I said, I was doing some religious work, nonprofit stuff. And he's like, oh, all right. And he kind of lit up. And I was like, oh, are you a believer of any kind? And he's like, oh, no, no, no. I'm the most secular man you ever met. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's cool. And he's like, um, he's like, but that's interesting. He goes, because I think God's up to something in this country. And it was re really interesting. So I'm like, and I'm like, really, why do you say that? And then they're like, come on, sir, take your shoes off, take your belt off, you know, get naked and walk through this thing. So they're kind of pushing you through. So I kind of put everything in. I get to the other side. And at that point, you know, you're kind of broke up. I was like, I just met him. Do I wait on him and like carry his back? It was like that awkward. So I was like, I'm just going to move on. But I, Mike and I went on to our plane and we're like, I was like, that's interesting. You know, we've waited six days and we get to the end and he says something like, God's up to something in this country. A secular man that would say, hey, I don't even have agnostic, atheist, something's out there, but I don't really know what it is. And we're in this season where we're speaking of Emmanuel, right? If you look in Matthew chapter one, verse 22, and it's, it's speaking of the coming of Jesus, born of a virgin, it says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means... Say it with me, God with us. And God has, and this is what we celebrate, we know this is not the actual day, but this is what we celebrate, that God, the God-man, fully man, right, born as a babe, um, he ate, he drank, he was hungry, he was thirsty, he was sad, he cried, he emoted. Um, he was very human, but he's also very God, performing miracles and signs and wonders where they were like, clearly the prophet is among us. He fulfilled, I mean, the likelihood of someone, one person fulfilling all, just eight of the prophecies of their, in the Old Testament is like one in 17 to the 10th power. Like it's unfathomable that one person and Jesus fulfilled them all. He was the God, man, God with us. And because of Jesus, Emmanuel, Jesus changes everything, changed everything. And this part of this series, I have, I have one kind of thematic point here, which is this, the God, man is with us. He's in us, he can be in us, and he can work through us. The God-man is with us, he can be in us, and he can work through us. First point is this, God is with us. God is with us, and he came as a babe. It was the man, Jesus, the God-man. Look at Colossians chapter one with me. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in all things, hold to, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all the fullness dwell in him. So this mystery that he was fully man and he was fully God. He was fully God and there were so many attributes of God on display, but then he was not omnipresent. He wasn't everywhere all the time, right? But then he was all knowing. So he would know what people were thinking or what, they were going, what their motives were. He would perform miraculous powers. He, would, he was born of a virgin. So there was all these prophetic fulfillments in Jesus because clearly he was God, but then clearly he was man and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. See, something happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus was born. God showed up in the form of a man. But then about 33 years later, something happened. Because Jesus even said this, you know, we celebrate the birth, and the birth is significant, obviously fulfillment of prophecy, but 33 years later, there was the death, the crucifixion, Right? of Jesus, where the God-man was crucified, the sinless man was crucified for the sins of humanity, right? On a cross. And something happened in that moment when he was crucified that all of a sudden it wasn't just God with us in the sense of, in, the, in a man, all of a sudden it says 
there was a, and there actually was in the temple, there was a curtain. And the curtain was supposedly about the size of a fist thick that no man could tear. And that curtain prevented anyone from going into what we call the Holy of Holies. And this is the place where God dwelled, right? So, and there was really one man, one time a year, that could kind of go in and kind of go in and make the penance for the sins of God's people, right? And that was called the Holy of Holies. And in Mark chapter 15, it says this powerful statement that when Jesus was born, and then he died, it says the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard this cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Something happened when the, the God man died 33 year, years later, the curtain was torn and all of a sudden the presence of God was unleashed to all humanity. And no longer was the holiness of God limited to one priestly man. And all of a sudden all of humanity had access to the holy God, which is incredible, but also a little bit frightening because <laughs> we're not a holy people. We're full of depravity and we're born into sin and we've got this, uh, we're bent, right? Friends, the death of Jesus, the God man was so tragic and painful, but his death brings liberty for the world. I would argue this though. This is what I want you to get with God is with us. It's not just God is with greenhouse. It's not just God is with Christians. It is God is with the world. You know, in our imperialistic missionary mindset, um, I think for centuries, missionaries would go into cultures that maybe never heard the name of Jesus. And they would say, we are bringing God with us because God is not here. But that's not true, is it? Because God is everywhere. The curtain's been torn and the presence of God is released all over the world. So in missionary training, it's like you show up and it's not like, hey, God's here because I contain God. No, no, no. Now it's like, no, no, God is up to something there and discovering what God is. It wasn't like we went to Uruguay and we said, all right, let's go. As soon as we step off the plane, God's going to show up. No, no, God is in Uruguay. Just like he's, many of you are from other countries. God is in your country and he's up to something. He's doing something. And it's all over the world. People are sensing, even tribes around the world are sensing the presence of God. And sometimes people have gifts. They have spiritual gifts that are from God and healings are happening, miracles are happening. People are like, there's, there's a God. Like, and they don't know what it is. They're worshiping something. They're agnostic maybe or they're choosing an animal or they're worshiping the sun. They're saying something. You wonder why we want to send monies around the world to proclaim the gospel because people are wondering, God is real. He's with the world. Who is he? <laughs> Who is he? People like Galen and Hannah are asking and people are saying, let us go take this, right? They're say so the, the question is, God is with the world. He's for the world. God is active in the world. He's trying to communicate that he cares about the world. God is with the world, <laughs> God has made himself available. You know, I feel like in times past, people were distracted by, um, like in 1 John chapter 2, where it says, the, the lust of his, our eyes and the lust of the flesh and the boasting of what we have and what we do, and we get distracted. In 1994, I was um, a freshman at a community college playing basketball, and I was trying to do a research paper. And... Um, I was in the library and I was studying, and uh, someone there said, uh, hey, if you're looking for information, you should get on this thing called the internet. And, <laughs> and I was like, what? And they, they walked me over to a computer, and they're like, yeah, there's a lot of information on here. It's actually called the World Wide Web. And I was, <laughs> so, I, mean, I, was not, I was 18 years old. This is 25 years ago, right? And so I'm like... I was like, man, that's ridiculous. And second of all, why would I want to go get involved in a web, right? I just feel like it would own me and like captivate me. A web sounds so dark, right? Like those of you who are afraid of spiders, anybody have arachnophobia in the house, right? <laughs> and, uh, 
And so it's like this World Wide Web that sounds so, but then we're like, wow, what a, over time I discovered, oh, I can get this thing called like an electronic mail. And, uh, and I, <laughs> I'm serious, like in the 90s, right, this was like discovery. And then I don't have to wait. I can, it can almost can be immediate. And then I'm having to choose like my user. I mean, I remember that whole process in the 90s. And then when I get to University of, Santa Fe, University of Florida, they're like, oh, you kind of have to have one. It was unfolding to this. And I was like, oh, clearly it's a blessing. What a grace that we can stay so connected to humanity around the world. Oh my gosh, what a blessing. I'm so glad God made people so smart to make us so connected. And I think what started as a brilliant idea to connect the world and disseminate information has ended up being truly a world wide web for us. And before I felt like there was like a distraction of like, you know, our desires and there wasn't, but now I feel like, and if you look statistically what's happening to Generation Z right now by the World Wide Web, and they're completely caught in it. So statistically, 14 to 20 year olds, um, activity, sinful activity, let's just say of like drunkenness or um, 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 sexual promiscuity and all of these activities are actually going down, 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 down. The birth rate in Japan, down, down, down. The birth rate in America, down, down, down. All this stuff is down, right? The activity of stuff. But depression, anxiety, suicide is skyrocketing in our culture. And all of a sudden we have a world, right, that started as a web of like, oh, look at this gift. The problem is, is the gift, if we focus too much on the gift, ends up captivating us all together, and in our culture right now, we live in a culture that's in the web, right? We're caught in the web. I mean, we're stuck, right? You ever watch that whole Charlotte's Web when, you know, the movie where things are stuck and I feel stuck. And all of a sudden you have a God of this universe who's trying to communicate to the world and to you and I that he's alive, he's active, he's with us. And we're all of a sudden we're staring in our phones and he's doing stuff all around us. You know, uh, when I was in Uruguay, one Friday, Mike and I both just had a study day, right? So he's somewhere, I'm somewhere. And I'm like, oh, I found this coffee shop. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go to this coffee shop. So I get out and I put the, it's a mile down the road. So I put it in my calendar. I think I have a little picture of this. And I'm going to walk it. And so I start walking it. It gives me directions. And it says, you know, so I start kind of following it. The problem is you get to an intersection and it says, turn right or follow this street. The problem is I don't speak the language. <laughs> so it's like, it's saying things to me and I'm just standing on the corner like I have no idea where to go. Have you guys ever been in that position? No idea where to go. But I didn't realize Google Maps has this amazing feature that says, continue this way. <laughs> so I'm standing at a corner looking around and it says out loud to me, continue this way, Robbie. So I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh. I'll just go this way. And I kept walking. And all of a sudden, as I'm walking, the screen goes blank and it says, put your phone down. <laughs> it actually told me, he's like, it could tell that I was stopped. I'd started walking. It said, Robbie, put your phone down. You're not paying attention to what's ahead of you. So I'm like, I put my phone down, then I pull it back up again and it pops back up again. As soon as I start walking, it pulls back down. And I feel like God has graced us with this amazing map and direction. The problem is we're staring with it and we're missing the surroundings that are going on all around us. God is up to something. And at the, at the, 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 the beginning story of how we approach Uruguay, I'd say this right here, as you head to lunch, and this is the vision of I'd say even um, God being with us is being aware that he's with the world world around you and recognizing he's up to something. And it's our job to participate in what God's up to. So many blessings that God's given us culturally, strengthen us with. But they become the focal point and we stare too long. We miss what God's doing all around us. See, there's a message that God is with us, but it's not just that God is with us the greater, most joyful message is that God can be within us. See, this is the shift, that, that's the distinctiveness of Christians, which is min, much of the world is experiencing God and aware that God is real and he's active and he's doing stuff. They just don't, a lot of people just don't know, you know, like even when we were in Uruguay, it was 70% um, are atheists and agnostic and maybe you're agnostic in here and you're like, 
I'm just coming to visit and hear and listen and discover, and I'm on this path of discovery. And man, praise God that you are with us right now. You know, or maybe from another religion, and you're trying to understand what Christianity's all about. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Seriously, you're our honored guest. Seriously, free coffee outside on Pastor Mike for you. And uh, <laughs> seriously, thank you for being with us. But listen to this. This is the promise of the gospel, right? It's not that God is just with humanity and with the world. Is that something happens when someone believes in Jesus, confesses him as Lord, and all of a sudden it says we are born from above. Like there is a transformation that happens on the inside. See, the Christmas story is that God is with the world. The gospel is that God can be within humans, that is the shift, <laughs> and it is the most powerful message in the world that our beings contain the God of this universe. We can't contain him, but we house him in some unique and powerful mystery, right? I mean, think about this in John chapter 1. I think I have John chapter 1, yes, verse 12. Yet to, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, that's all of us, right? Even those online in traditions, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Some people say, oh, I'm a born-again Christian, right? And it comes a little cliche, almost derogatory in a sense, but something happens if you believe in Jesus, confess his name, repent of your sins, all of a sudden we receive God on the inside of us. Woo! <laughs> Let that sink in for a little bit. That's Wild. <laughs> it's the distinctiveness. It's supposed to set us apart, not our political party, right? It's like our distinctiveness should be that God is within us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Now it is God who made us for his very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come, right? Jump with me to Ephesians chapter one, verses 13 through 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, right, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. This is the seal, right, that happened on the inside of you. Romans chapter eight, verses 14 through 16. Because those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. There's this unique change on the inside. And I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. This is, this is why it's so frustrating when you're like, oh, say this little cute sinner's prayer and you'll be saved, right? I'm like... Okay, so if I just say I believe in Jesus, the, and I just kind of flippantly say that, <laughs> and there's, there's no genuine, like, submitting of our lives to God, like, we're saying the God of the universe is coming into humans that are kind of adding God on to all of their other preferences in life? <laughs> I mean, think about that. I mean, that's why Charles Finney, when he was like in the, kind of in the Great Awakening, he was like, he had a conversion rate of people that would stay following Jesus to supposedly of like around 90%. Because he's like, listen, have you repented of every known sin? Because what you're going to do is what he calls false conversions. And people would come up and say, yeah, I believe. I mean, can he help me with my marriage? I mean, I'll believe if he can help me. I mean, I'm really broke. Can he help me? You know, I've got these issues. Can he help me? But then he comes on and says, no, no, listen, regardless of what you think you're going to get from God, will you submit to God your whole life because he's God? <laughs> and there's like a complete yielding of yourself. In Galatians 2.20, and I don't think we have the scripture, it says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. There's a born from above. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. Man, you are working hard back there. Let's go. <laughs> And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So it is God with everyone. And you're like, people are like, man, they said they felt God, but they don't believe in Jesus, so they didn't feel God. No, no, 
listen to me, man. God loves everyone. Imago Dei, if they're made in the image of him, he cares deeply for them. And he's up to stuff in places that don't even believe or have heard the name of Jesus because he loves humanity, right? The shift is God is with the world, but God is in when someone confesses and believes and surrenders. (laughs) Man, I I remember when I started following Jesus, it was a three-hour conversation. And I remember just saying like, oh man, this sounds great. I mean, forgiveness of sins, born again, placed in heaven, right? But... Listen, there's a doctrine of regeneration. Like, it's when your whole, everything, like, <laughs> and someone's like, oh, I lost my salvation yesterday. I was like, you lost, whoa, whoa, whoa. Talk, talk to me what you mean by salvation. Because t- when you're talking about being reborn from above and you just lost that yesterday and you got it back today, how does that happen? <laughs> you guys with me? I mean, I don't know what you understand about the transaction of conversion and salvation when God comes in a human being and like, oh, got it, lost it, got it, lost it. Oh, I sinned. Oh, no, I'm glad. Woo-hoo. That's dangerous territory, right? I'm thinking God's got power to transform people and get on the in, within us, right? One more verse. Can we get another Bible verse? Can we get another Bible verse? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you even have that one? Man, he's quick. I pray that... Out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. God is with us. God can be within us. Even this morning, man, maybe some of you are online, maybe even traditions, and you've loved the culture of Christianity. You even love the values of Christianity. You even love the community of Christianity. You even love the care for the poor of Christianity. And all of those are good things. The distinctiveness of Christianity is Jesus. <laughs> and, and man, there's like an invitation this morning. To, yet to all who received him, right? So there's a reception saying, God, I really just, you, you are God. And I, my whole life is yours. Maybe today's the day where you like, there's a shift within you. It's not just you're aware of God. You recognize God around you working, and you see God moving in this city and in your country or in, the, in your family, but you actually, all of a sudden, there's a, there's, a trend, there's a change on the inside of you. Mike and I, won. we met a guy in our hotel, so we invited him to dinner. I invited him to watch even right now online, and um, it was a beautiful, beautiful conversation. We went to dinner with him, and... Uh, his name's Bo, really cool guy, and uh, it was just great because we were like, we just invited him in, and we said, hey, Bo, God can, God can, God's, God loves you enough that he actually flew a couple of guys down from the States. You're working here in Uruguay building planetariums, and we just kind of intersected with you, and now we're eating dinner at La Vaca, right, which is a place called The Cow. Incredible steaks. My goodness. Uruguay. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and he was like, yeah. And I said, God can take residence on the inside of you. And this is the beauty of the gospel is it's not just the best way to die. It's also the best way to live. Like he's got the message to die with and he's got the message to live with. See, because this is even the next point, which is this is God is with us. God is, can be within us, but God works through us. God works through us. It's not that God is just with humanity through Jesus coming to earth. It's not that God is just within believers as a, as a deposit till he comes. It's that God longs to work through us. You know what? You know what I just love to see happen this morning? That if, you're, if God is within you, that there'd be a shift, that you'd embrace his spirit and that he's in you, and you would long every single day, that we would long as a community, that every single day, God would work through us. See, that's a shift. That's a shift for a lot of us. It's like every single day becomes like this mission trip. (laughs) 
every single day. We were made for purpose and destiny. You know, I, I, over the years, interacting with a lot of Christians, it's like sometimes I meet Christians that are like alive, and then other times we meet Christians that are like dormant. And it's not like the spirit has left them. It's just that it, they're no longer a through Christian. <laughs> it's like he's still in there, but he's not exploding out of in any capacity, or there's not even an awakening or desire. And there's a sense of purposelessness. And I'm like, Lord, would you help us to be the most activated community in the world? <laughs> that we would have this longing for God to explode through us. There's a book that a Pastor Matt read, is reading his doctoral program called um, Dedication and Leadership. And um, it's about a guy, Carlos Hyde, Douglas Hyde, that was a communist. He got recruited in when he was 17 years old. He spent 20 years in the Communist Party. He left the Communist Party and became a Catholic. So this book is his lectures to the Catholic Church on what they can learn from the Communist Party. Oh, it's great. One, <laughs> one unique virtue that I loved was, and there's a lot to take from on their dedication, their sacrifice. He said that after leaving the Communist Party, he would meet other people who had left the Communist Party, and they would talk about their experiences in there. And they're like, some of them are good, some of them bad. But then they'd hit this moment, and they would stare in each other's eyes. And they're like, do you remember the dedication we had? And they'd reminisce together and they'd say, I'd wake in the morning and I'd say, help me, help me move the Communist Party forward. And we dream about how we're going to do that. There was a publication about the Communist Party. I would take two of them. This one, I'd take two of them on the bus ride with me. One would be for reading. And when I'd read it, I'd hold it up like this so everyone could watch what I'm reading and hopefully stir, stir curiosity. Then when I got off the bus, I would leave the, the extra one on the seat in case someone was interested and they were too shy to ask, they could scoop up that copy. Then I would get to work and I'd all always at lunch be sitting in strategic places to be able to have certain conversations about the communist party. And then after work, everyone that was a part of communi our communist party would gather around each other and say, hey, what progresses did you make today? What conversations did you have? Any persuasion? Are there any potential recruits here at the workplace? All right. Then I would go home, I would shower and we'd move and we'd take some more instruction about how to advance the communist party. And they're like, do you remember that dedication and that purpose we had in life? And now I have no purpose. You know, there's something about not just having God within you, but being deeply in touch with the purpose he has made you for and living on that purpose. See, the, the vision here this morning is in this like God-man series is that we'd understand who Jesus is what he has done for us and what is available to us and how God can move through us. I remember, uh, and I met when I, my granny passed away about three weeks ago, 93 years old, amazing woman of God. Um, I remember her, uh, her uh, roommate, she was in assisted living for the last like two years and we go visit her and her roommate's like, she always wakes up in the night praying really loud. I'm like, that's my granny. <laughs> She probably, she didn't really recognize her for the last, you know, maybe three years or something like that. But, uh, um, but anyway, in her, in her funeral, I, the, the pastor in May that I was uh, doing the funeral with, um, I, I looked at him. I said, hey, um, he came over to my granny's house after she had passed and all the family was there. And he sits down next to me, Brother Dell. And I said, uh, I said, Brother Dell, good to see you. He said, good to see you too, Robbie. And I said, uh, do you remember what happened? You know, 20 years ago, what, what God did through you to me? And he's like, no. And I said, I've told this story a few times. I said, I was, I was at church. You were pastoring the church. There was a time of prayer. I was standing up the front. I was feeling dry, and I kind of had my hands like this. And I said, and you walked by me, and music's going, and you stopped. And you said, you said, Robbie, the Lord told me to tell you something. I said, all right. He said, he told me to tell you he didn't just save you just to save you. He saved you because he wanted to use you to save other people. And I was like, 
And I said, I remember distinctly that he's like, Robbie, praise God for all the jollies and the goosebumps and all that stuff, but I've got mission for you. I've got purpose for you. And I said, Brother Dale, I don't know if you remember this, but then you, tried, then you went to pray for me. You said, and God told me to pray for you, and you went to pray for me, and before your hands could touch me, it was like a bolt of lightning exploded on the inside of me. <laughs> and he's like, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> and I was like, well, it was a life transforming for me. And, uh, and I, re- I, re- I remember distinctly that moment of God recommissioning, because sometimes Christianity can be about, I don't, what is God doing for me, right? And so we get caught up on our goosebumps, our feelings, our sense of God, where God is actually trying to um, bring us alive to do something through us, right? So if we make ourselves available, so it's not just that God is with the world, it's not just God is in us, I would ask you guys to say that this let today be a day where I go on mission because God has made me for purpose <laughs> and I make myself available that like man I've, I'm gonna be a missionary to my world that I live in right here some of you felt a call to the mission field at some point and you feel like that call has passed <laughs> listen welcome to Gainesville Florida <laughs> There's nothing. I mean, we spent, we spent days with missionaries there. There's nothing they're doing that you cannot do and even are more equipped to do here in Gainesville, Florida. You're like, well, I need to get on the mission field. My goodness, people. Love some people around you. It's active. He's moving and partner with them to see what he's up to in their lives. You know what I love about this passage, though? In Matthew chapter 1, where it says, it's God with us. You know, God never, throughout Scripture, it was rarely ever you, it was ne- rarely my faith, it was not individualistic, it was collective. Even when in Colossians chapter 3 where he's talking about the sins and he's talking about since you have been raised with Christ, set your mind on things above, right? So I read that passage and I say, set my mind, Robbie, on things above, but Paul was speaking more collectively. It's actually Southern, it'd be you all, like if it was, it's plural, right? And so instead of saying like, since you have been raised with Christ, it's kind of like, since y'all been raised with Christ, (laughs) set your, you all's mind on things above, not on earthly things, right? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your all, you all's earthly nature, right? Because what happens is I've got a small deposit and I'm a small expression of who God is. And I think God can use me in the same way you have a deposit from God um, of his spirit inside of you. And you are an expression of God to the world around you. The problem is, is our small deposit doesn't give a full reflection of the character and nature of God. Someone say amen to that. So that's why we need the body of Christ activated. We don't need me activated. There was even, we were, the the missionaries were there, Bob and Jennifer, amazing couple, been in your way 30 years, they're from Mississippi, and they're just tired and they're weary, and we're going to the airport, and you could feel them like the proverb says, there's a proverb that says, like a cold glass of water in the desert is good news from a foreign land. And us visiting with them, being there with them, they were like, man, this was so refreshing. And And we looked at them and said, why don't you guys come to Gainesville? And I said, you're going to be on furlough for a year this year. They're going to be raising money and going back. And I said, why don't you come and just spend some time with us? And um, just, a, just, a, just a week with us there in Gainesville. And they're like, well, we're going to try and do that. And Mike walked away from me. And he's like, Robbie, he said, could you imagine if we, when we get them to Gainesville? He's like, we put them in like a microchurch with a hot seat. Then we ask God to speak. And then there's words and. The spirit moves and the gifts of mercy and compassion and prophecy. And, and it, was, it was almost like he was saying, it's not God with me. I think Mike and I encouraged them and there was a deposit. We used our deposit to move. The, but listen, if you've got like lots of deposits and lots of activated people, we get them the gains. I was like, oh my gosh. See, that's, that's the vision for microchurches. It's not like everyone comes and the microchurch leader has his deposit active and everyone's like, feed us, right? It's more like everyone comes, they bring their deposits activated, and then it's like, woo, party up in this house tonight, right? The 
the key is us, a greater reflection. See, um, in the book of Acts, God was in people. But the book of Acts is a prescriptive, prescriptive story of God working through human beings, very normal human beings, just like you and I, that were fully submitted. They're not superheroes. Even when you look at the hall of faith, you know, in Hebrews chapter 11, very normal people. But they had been immersed in the power of God and had submitted themselves and God was flowing through them in a real unique and powerful way. John Piper would even say this when you're looking at the work of the Spirit through a believer. He says, clearly in the book of Acts and all throughout Paul's epistles in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit was never meant to just be inferred, which is like understood and explained. He was meant to be experienced. And every time someone got immersed or baptized in the Spirit, there would be like this exuberant praise, this passionate boldness, this incredible courage. There would be prophecy. There'd be thanksgiving. There'd be spontaneous songs. I, like if I, if I had one request from God for every believer in this room that God is within you, is that you would have a hunger today that God would work through you today, right? You're like, well, on Tuesday. No, 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 listen. We get so forward. That, like today, like after service, lunch today, right? Today, right? This would be that day where God baptizes you, he immerses you, he fills you, he dominates you. See, that's the prescriptive story, right? I'm glad all of us are really intelligent and really good looking and really gifted and all that stuff. But what we need is an immersion, a baptism of fullness of God. In just a second, and worship team, you guys can come on out. We're gonna have some time of response in worship. I would ask that maybe just to, you would stay. You wouldn't rush out and try and, I wanna beat the traffic because I wanna do it. Would you just stay for a little bit and just say, God, I'm hungry for you to work through me today. Would you fill me? You know, as I have a group of college students I do like a core group with, and we were talking about the, the Holy Spirit, and we were talking about the deposit, and then we were talking about through, and we were talking about tongues and gifts and all this stuff that's all throughout the New Testament. And we were like, man, you know, and it's just like it feels weird and it's awkward, and uh, I don't even know. And I was like, you know, what you, you know what the request is like, God, I'm hungry for you, and I'm hungry for you to go through me to others, and whatever I need to do that, please give it to me. <laughs> please give it to me. The other application would be this. If you want God to work through you, this is why we, we, we really disciple into to start your day with a time with God where you're asking God to fill you. You think, you think through your coworkers and the people you're going to be interacting with, the opportunity God's going to have through your life that day. And you say, God, would you use me today? Would you touch my words? Would you help me to never gossip or slander about your imago day? Would you help me to think in ways that are going to honor you? And would you help me every, if, let me be aware of that moment when you are moving and the wind's going. Help me to have my cells up. If there was a simple application would be this. Tomorrow morning and then Tuesday morning and then Wednesday morning. You get on your knees and you say, God, fill me. You open up the scriptures and say, give me some bread today. I'm hungry. And some of us are really good about making a meal plan for the week. And we cook all our meals and we're really thoughtful about that. And that's super good. And I'm glad everyone's really healthy. But man, the good, the, your physical body is doing great, but then your soul is starving. Would you ask God to fill you and dominate you and rule you?